What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Dark Crisis and yes, the Justice League is dead. That's something that we covered in the previous videos that we did. And so with these guys out of the picture, what we end up getting are a couple different things. The first is the funeral for the Justice League, right? Which is literally being put on and is celebrating their life. Now, this is one of the things to understand here when it comes to the Justice League and especially coming off the heels of the Black Adam film. I feel like this is something we need to talk about. So when it comes to the different superhero teams in DC Comics, if we're really talking about the originals, we're talking about the Justice Society of America. But going on like the modern day depiction of the team, the JSA was basically the superhero team in DC Comics that existed during World War II. When the members of the JSA retired, the Justice League took up the mantle of becoming the protectors of Earth, and they really take a lot of their homage from the JSA. So much so that when the JSA reformed when Jeff Johns was writing it back in the early 2000s, that what you got was, in a lot of ways, the Justice League paying the respects to the history of the JSA. And there's a lot of like, they came before us, they laid the groundwork for a lot of the things that we do, that kind of stuff. But the Justice League was massive in their own right. The JSA was a more ground roots team. They were a more base level focusing on earthly threats, that kind of a thing. The Justice League taking to the stars, facing off against the world ending, giant calamity, cosmic spacefaring threats, they dealt on a much larger stage. And so that's why what you see here in this funeral is basically every single superhero or even superpowered being from across the world for the passing of the Justice League. And you even have some people here who are villains, right? Individuals there who basically put those grievances aside, those grudges aside to pay their respects to the team. Now, of course, as you would expect, Nightwing is the one who's basically giving the eulogy. And that makes sense. For those of you guys who aren't really familiar with this or don't really know why, when it comes to DC Comics, different characters play different roles, right? Superman is kind of the, the great grandiose, right? The, the superhero that in one way or another, virtually all other superheroes look up to, right? All other superheroes look to this guy as like the beacon, right? The light, the, the thing that they can, they can try to achieve, but in a more relatable way, Nightwing represents that as well. And that's why if you go and you read DC comics, Nightwing is consistently referred to as the best of everyone because where Superman's like, this is what humanity could be in the future. Nightwing is like, but this is how great we could be right now. That kind of a thing, right? That kind of situation. And so it's why a lot of fans are super, super hardcore about Nightwing. It's why he's one of the more celebrated characters in DC comics. But while this whole eulogy and this whole funeral is going on, Deathstroke is watching. Now, now, here's the really cool thing here, right? Because what we end up doing, we don't really get into him immediately. Instead, we pick up with two weeks later. And what's happening here is essentially this new kind of Justice League-esque team, right? Just kind of a loose band of superheroes, more or less, is facing off against Cobra, which is just kind of like this crazy religious cult that exists out there. They do have a big history. They are important in some ways, but for this story, they're not. But basically what's established is that over the course of the last two weeks, a lot of these groups are just launching strikes at the superhero community consistently all the time, right? Like literally taking advantage of the vacuum that's left by the Justice League, everybody's launching these attacks against superheroes. And as a result of that, they're basically stretched thin in a lot of different ways. Now, there are responses from people like Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern. You do have Wally West, the Flash. You do have people who step in. But the other part of this is you end up having Hal Jordan and Wally West, as well as Superman, that meet with Black Adam. Now, remember, Black Adam is the only survivor of the conflict with Pariah. Everybody else died. Right, everybody else was was basically destroyed or at least whisked away by Pariah, but they're no longer part of the equation. And so, because of that, Black Adam literally says, like, like the Justice League was ripped apart by Pariah's powers. Right, like I'm the only person who survived. I made it back in one piece, and it was only because of the magic that I had at my disposal. But the thing about this is they don't really know if they can trust Black Adam on this. Now, one of the things to know is that, you know, with the film depiction of Black Adam, it wasn't really all that wrong. And in terms of the core nature of Black Adam, that movie really depicted him more of like waking up in the world and then realizing things are different. But what will likely take place when it comes to the Black Adam film, the second movie is exactly as you see Black Adam in the comics, which is a fierce protector of Kondok. And that's how he is here. But sometimes he's been a hero. Sometimes he's been a villain. He's 
best described as an anti-hero where he doesn't really have any allegiance to any one particular side. He just has allegiances to himself and the people of Kandak. And so that's why the Justice League, or at least this, this superhero band, is a little uncertain about trusting him because it's like, this guy has worked against us before. And what's to say that he didn't ally himself with Pariah or anything like that? Like, what's to say that didn't happen? But at the end of the day, the stance of Superman, or at least Superboy, right, Jonathan Kent, the son of Superman, is we need to find some kind of a team. We have to reform the Justice League because the Justice League stands for more than simply just like a group of people who face off against threats. The Justice League stands for something greater, right? It stands for the idea of hope, for benefiting things. And so what you end up having is basically Jonathan Kent, who goes to Wally West, who goes to Hal Jordan and is like, I get that you guys want to go find Barry Allen. I get that you guys want to deal with like the great darkness and this evil that's kind of permeating everything. I totally get that's what you're shooting for. But here's the problem. The threats here on Earth, the violence is increasing. These villains are coming out of the woodwork. We have to find some way to deal with that. And their response is, that's your job. That's what you're here for, right? Form a new Justice League, form a new team, create a new team that can basically help combat these threats on Earth. And when those threats are neutralized, you can join us in facing off on the bigger threat. Now, the reality here is this makes perfect sense. Right, when it comes to somebody like Hal Jordan, he's a seasoned superhero. He's been around for a long, long time. Wally West, while he is kind of, well, at least started out as a protege of Barry Allen, he's been around for so long and has done so much, he's top tier as well. Their efforts are better served hunting for Barry Allen, trying to find the great darkness, focusing on the bigger threats that are out there. Jonathan is still relatively new to the superhero scene. He's capable, right? He's very, very powerful, but in a lot of ways, he's untested. He hasn't been through the same sort of gauntlets that like Hal Jordan and Barry Allen and Wally West and his father, Superman, Wonder Woman, any of those guys have been through over the course of their time. And so in a lot of ways, it's kind of him coming into his own yet again, sort of stepping into his father's shoes to a degree, informing the Justice League. And so what he ends up doing is traveling to Brazil and visiting Yara, who is a woman that's kind of taken on the newest moniker of Wonder Girl. Now, Wonder Girl is a name that's been used over the years in DC Comics, where it was kind of like the, the Wonder Woman equivalent of like Superboy or something like that. Yara is a girl who is part of an Amazonian tribe based out of the Brazilian rainforest that ended up taking up the mantle of Wonder Girl in the absence of Wonder Woman. And so because of her background and her experience that when Jonathan pitches the idea to her, her of forming a new Justice League that he's putting together a team, she's just kind of like, no, I'm, I am not joining that team. Now, here's the issue here, right? Again, John is untested, but in a lot of ways, and this is one of the things that Joshua Williamson does not overtly hit on, but it's kind of been an on-running theme for John. In a lot of ways, he's just the younger, unproven Superman. He's not his dad. And because he's not his dad, people just don't see him the same way. And it's one of those things where despite all of that, John always kind of continues to persevere. He doesn't quite give up, which really is kind of a testament to the nature of his character. Because for a lot of us out there, for example, like I'm the third member of my family, right? Of my, of my father's name. So because of that, when you have this situation, like living up to the legacy of your parents, in a lot of ways, a lot of us can relate to that. And it could be a difficult thing, right? Maybe you have a super successful older brother or older sister or maybe your dad was on a whole different level of success and it's the pressure to live up to that, right? But whatever it is, a lot of us have that member of our family that we're kind of compared to by everybody else. And so unlike a lot of us who would look at that and almost kind of beat ourselves over the head for not living up to that or finding ourselves being frustrated because people just don't see us for who we are. They see us as we could be that person. Jonathan doesn't feel that way, right? Jonathan doesn't really take it that way. It is a little disheartening that nobody wants to join his team but it's not one of those things of like, people see me as a poor man, Superman. It's not really that way. And it's kind of a cool thing because again, it goes to the nature of his character. So what he ends up doing is traveling to the city of New York and meeting with Jace Fox. Now Jace Fox is kind of like one of the newest versions of Batman that's out there, right? Like, I mean, Bruce Wayne is still a character that exists, but Jace Fox was from Future State, right? The, it was an event that DC did where they were trying to rework things and so on. It was it was one of those events where they were trying to drum up interest even though nobody really seemed to care all that much. I didn't. 
I stopped covering it maybe like a few issues in. I was like, this story sucks. And I'll probably go back and delete the videos because, you know, whatever. We're probably never going to finish it. Maybe we will. I don't know. I don't have a desire to. But the important thing here is that Jace Fox is the newest iteration of Batman. And so when you have Jonathan who shows up and is like, hey, uh, so like Superman needs a Batman, dude. Like world's finest, right? Like my dad, Bruce Wayne, you and I can make that kind of thing happen too. The response of Jace, who is similar to Bruce Wayne in the sense that he's a little skeptical, but he's also more cynical than Bruce Wayne was. His response is like, no, like I'm not doing that. The last Batman who teamed up with anybody ended up dead. Go ask one of the Robins, but I'm not teaming up with anybody. And he ultimately leaves. And that's when you kind of get a little bit of disheartening to a degree, but you also end up getting people who join his side, right? So for example, you end up getting like, like, well, Swamp Thing says no, but you do end up getting like Harley Quinn who seems to join his side. You get Damian Wayne who joins, right? Killer Frost is like, I mean, I guess, right? Like uh, Supergirl is kind of like, I mean, you know, maybe. Right, but like these different people kind of seem to latch on and seem to, to take on the idea. And so what you end up getting is of course the Justice League basically reforming. Now, the funny thing about this is you do have Jonathan who has a conversation with Black Adam and Black Adam's response is like, I get what you're trying to do here, Jonathan, but here's the issue. You're not ready for this, right? You have this picture of the Justice League in your head, which is a romanticized ideology, right? But you're not actually seeing the Justice League for what it is. And that's a fair point to make because as people, we do that all the time, right? Nostalgia is a perfect example of that. Just because we remember things being a certain way doesn't mean they were that way. That's just how we remember it, right? Like the perfect life when we were little kids. And when it comes to Jonathan looking at the Justice League, it's the same way. So many people out there looked at the Justice League as like these great heroes who did great things. And in a lot of ways they did. They were great heroes who did great things. But there's a difference between watching the Justice League and being in the Justice League, putting your life on the line every single time you go out and face some threat, never knowing if you're gonna make it back alive, having the back of that person and trusting that, that person will have your back as well fighting as a cohesive, organized team. That when it came to the Justice League as it existed, the reason why it was so capable is because one, the experience the various heroes brought to the table, but two, they had spent so long working together, right? It's like being in a marriage where you've been together for like 50 years. After a while, you just know what the other person's thinking. And when it was the Justice League, it was the exact same way. Because they'd spent so much time together, they were just kind of one cohesive unit that could almost function effortlessly. What Jonathan's doing here is he's taking the idealized, romanticized view of the Justice League, slapping a team together and saying, we can be just like them. All the while seemingly failing to realize that everybody has their own little quirks. They have their own little unique attributes and different things like that. And that that's going to come to bear in terms of how the team functions, if it even really functions effectively at all. But the benefit of what, what Jonathan's doing here is this represents the fact that he hasn't given up. It represents the fact that he hasn't quit, that at the end of the day, the world does need a Justice League, and Jonathan Kent has formed a new one. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.